colonial regime and the war that was going on because of the, the French colonialists. And so people, you know, they couldn't really do anything about it. So quite often, you know, they end, people end up having fights. Like there's a lot of inter-Algerian violence, right? And he also explains, on the other hand, that there appeared a liberatory violence of the Algerians who were, you know, conscious of, of what they were doing and were organized and resisting against the, the French colonialists who were trying to prevent the Algerians from having autonomy and control of their own country. And just when I was reading his book, especially in prison, I started really thinking about the stereotypes of prisoners, like especially what you see in movies and in books. You know, the cold, slothful, violent predators, right? That's what you always see at CSI, you know? And, uh, you know, I've been in, in enough at this point to realize that the cold stereotype is not really that these are people are cold because they are sort of unemotional. Or it's actually like a very rational, adaptive behavior that probably anybody, if you were put in prison for any length of time, would be would find yourself adapting. Like the, you would stop showing your emotions to other people in prison, but in particular the administration or the guards, because there is a certain percentage of guards who, you know, enjoy charging people or just knowing that you're mad can stimulate them, you know. Like if it, and you don't want people to realize that you're on the verge of getting pissed off. Or even other prisoners. I mean, it's, there, it's not a perfect place. And there's quite often a pecking order. And also even, even really happy, being super happy. That can be super irritating to some people, and in particular to guards. I remember one time, we were up in the yard at P4W, there was about four of us, and it was a beautiful day. We were having a great time together. I don't know what we were doing, laughing, and the guards thought we were hot. So we all got sent up to the medical unit, it's called, and uh, the white woman, an indigenous woman again, of course, was put in segregation for being under the influence, and she wasn't. And she got really pissed, you know, like sort of trash thing again. And, it, and she's another one. She's a person who ended up in segregation for many, many years. And then, like, the lazy stereotype. You know, if you go into a prison and if you can sort of hide and watch people, like, all the work is pretty much custodial, whether it's working the laundry or sweeping the floors or if they have prisoners involved in cooking. And very few people are going to work their butt off, you know, like to clean a co the corridors or the offices of the guards or do laundry or anything. So, I mean, because it is pretty universally if you're in there seen as the enemy, even if you're not one of the people who's super involved in conflict. But on the other hand, especially today where there's really no money, like, you know, it's really difficult to be able to afford to keep in touch with your family if you're making long distance calls or sending out letters with stamps. And if you're in one of these, it's very typical to men's medium and minimum prisons to have these units or bungalows too, where you have cooks who are like, like, it makes sense, you know, using the roast beef to get tobacco or whatever, right? So I think that the black market, the level of black market activity that's going on in prisons is very high. You know, um, so a lot of people are involved in, in drug transactions, uh, gambling, uh, you know, exchanging whatever they can in terms of black market activity. And again, it's an adaptive, rational behavior, you know, like that you just sort of fall into. And certainly on that level, prisoners are very industrious, very smart. And um, I think a lot of that sort of uh, activity you could also look at people on the outside, you know, um, who are living in very poor areas. Uh, and you could say the same thing, you know, that um, if you were living, like, well, there was an, I heard on the CBC not too long ago about this, this sort of experiment they did where they sent these job applications in. And some of them, they, they were all, they all had the same educational level because they were, made, they were made up, obviously, and the same, uh, job skills. Some were like sent in by Mohammed Hassan, another one by Rob, Robert Rodriguez, another one by Susan White, another one by Betty Brown. Well, of course, Susan White and Betty Brown, they were they got the jobs sight unseen, whereas Mohammed and Robert Rodriguez didn't. So I mean, it's just to show that 
Um, you know, if you have a foreign name, especially of a particular racialized group that is not wanted, that is not that is you know, being discriminated against, you're not even going to get in the door for a job. So it's just sort of one example of many of how people, why people are, end up being impoverished, you know? Um, and so, like people in prison, I think if you're uh, raised in an area where very few, let's say, black people manage to get jobs for, for, for racially discriminatory reasons, but then one of your neighbors, this is, let's say we have, let's say we haven't legalized pot yet, offers you a pound of pot to sell, and you know, you know, people want to smoke pot. Well, it's to me, once again, it's a very logical thing for people to engage in crime, right? Like, what do you do when you, are you going to work at McDonald's for 25 hours a week for a minimum wage? Or are you going to make half decent money on the black market so you can, you know, clothe your children? and um, have a car, you know. I mean, I don't think it's because people are deviant or lazy or, or anything that people do engage in black market activity. I think a lot of it, you're really, I'm sure there's exceptions, but a lot of it I think stems from it being a logical adaptive behavior. And once you're in that situation, you don't have the privilege of, of the, it's more of a white privilege of calling the cops, you know, like most people, especially if you're in, from a white privileged community and somebody's breaking in, or it's going to call the cops. But if you're in, a, in an area or you yourself are engaged in black market activity, that is not an option, right? And in prison, it's the same sort of thing, you know. Um, a lot of the violence is associated with the, the black market activity that goes on in there. So I was, um, I was asked back in Ontario to go to this, another class probably similar to this, um, to speak uh, about prisons. And so we're talking, and I realized there's only one black man in the class. And when we started using words like minorities and marginalized, racialized minorities, victims, he left. And I kind of took it over. I thought, well, maybe he's got an appointment or something. And we you know, just blah, 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 and didn't spiel. And then he comes back right at the end. Now, I don't know why he left, but at the time, it did strike me that when the word victim and racialized minority came up, that was when he left. And I think, you know, when, again, uh, um, I don't know anybody in prison, myself, who would want to be, who, who sees themselves as a victim, you know? Um, or, like, again, some sort of pitiful, like, to be, they don't want to, people don't want to be pitied, they don't see themselves as helpless. It's more a situation where, um, you know, this, like when we say we live in a sexist, racist society with uh, growing economic disparity, uh, those, they, those abstract statements, the evidence, like sort of the scientific evidence of it is, you can be seen at the so-called bottom. You know, like when you look at the demographics in prison, 30% of the women in prison are indigenous, and I think they're about 4% of the general population. And I know that since the prison for women closed, um, within 10 years, the number of indigenous women had increased by 100% from since P4W closed. And again, you can sort of Google this stuff, because I, I looked this up before, just so I'm not just making things up. Like the Federal Correctional Investigator, also stated that between 2005 and 2015, the percentage of black prisoners increased by 70%. And the fastest growing population is not like white male serial killers or violent white men. It's actually women, juveniles, and uh, racialized minorities, you know. So I think you can pretty much conclude from that that you know, unless you believe that these demographics are actually genetically predisposed to become criminals, there really isn't any other explanation as to why there's such a disproportionate number of indigenous and uh, marginalized minorities. So the, the, the people in prison, 
they have been, you know, that they are in this structural, systemic situation that, that is racist, and in terms of women, sexist. And so it's not because they are uh, deviants or dysfunctional or weak or stupid that they're in prison. It's because they were born or, or in what, however it happened, or, you know, put in, like we're in this situation where, you know, they have a choice to work at McDonald's or some other minimum wage, 25 hour a week job, or sell cocaine on the side, or a little bit of pot, or whatever it takes, right? Fence, goods. And so, um, you know, it takes actually a lot of people who are involved in the black market are not stupid people. It's just capitalism in an illegal setting, you know, just been made illegal. Um, and, and most, I, I can't really think of very many women in prison that I would feel like are these pitiful, helpless people, you know. I would bet a lot of money that if you took, let's say, 20 women from, let's say, UBC, and then you put them out in some wilderness area, and then you took 20 women from the Fraser Valley Institute, I think within days the women in Fraser Valley would be eating the women in from university for breakfast. You know what I mean? Like they are very adaptive, very quick-witted, and um, you know have learned to uh, use their own intelligence and wits to survive. You know, so um, yeah, I think that the, that stereotype is is an adaptive, rational one. And uh, on the other side of the coin, I think that the the the, the, the conservatives have always used that sort of negative stereotype of the violent, slothful predator, you know, to justify their law, their law and order policies. And, um, whereas I think on the other side of the coin, the, the stereotype of the, of the victim, you know, the pitiful, helpless person is used by the more liberal elites to justify their reform policies. So, well, you know, if we could educate and get jobs and treat all of the prisoners for their addictions and counseling, then we wouldn't have this big problem of increasing prison populations. You know, but um, if you were to, let's say you did an experiment and you took everybody in Fraser Valley for, and for a year or so, and you gave them all like trade job skills training, education, treating addictions, counseling, and let's say you were able to they, they were able to um, become productive, as people say, citizens, right? I would think that it would only be a week before prison would be filled again, simply because if you, I think most people, are, uh, I don't know how you guys view capitalism, but I think everybody's aware that a very small percentage, like the classic euphemism, 1%, but there's a small percentage of people uh, within the global cap, you know, capitalist community own, you know, massive amounts of wealth, right? And large numbers of people have to work to produce that wealth, unless you really believe those people are somehow earning it on their own, which is ludicrous. A small group of people cannot physically or, or mentally earn all that money. It's only through the, the labor of, especially the 1%, like millions of people have to work super hard for those people who have all that money. And then, as well, there's a huge number of people who have to also be employed to protect them, that money, in terms of armies or police or whatever. So I would suggest that there's a, well, this is, I'm not suggesting this, I'm probably the entire position going down here, but uh, capitalism, I think everybody also understands, functions on the concept of surplus labor. Like there's always had to be a certain percentage of surplus labor in order to keep wages low, whether that is used to be within, let's say, the United States and Canada itself. Now that we have globalization on a global scale, there has to be large numbers of people who are basically haven't got jobs in order to be available for that really super cheap labor. It's, you know, working on migrant farms, mines. There's all kinds of jobs where they employ people, but as our society becomes more and more computerized, as technology takes over labor, I think that there, well, I don't think this is just me, but we have a surplus of surplus labor. In other words, 
growing percentages of the population that could be classified as obsolete and disposable. Like, and I think you guys are young enough to see that coming, you know, where there's good, what are we going to do? Like, there's all these people. Where are they going to work? How are they going to get money? They could have guaranteed annual incomes, which is probably what will happen, but they won't, and they'll have to do that because in order for people to be rich, people have to buy shit, right? And if you have no money, you can't buy anything. But even then, there's probably still going to be more people who are unemployed or that they, 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 that isn't enough, the guaranteed annual income, assuming that that happens. So I would believe that that segment of the population um, would probably be the product for the growing, it's, you know, hypothetically, but I would assume the, a growing pris, a private prison industry. In the States, that's what's happening. I mean, there's a, if you guys ever study prisons, there's a growing private prison um, complex in the States. In Canada, it's more like in smaller, like they have food contracted out to private enterprise, like a group called the Compass Group. They have a cook chill operation, they call it in Ontario at Maplehurst, which is like a super prison, like I described. There's a number of these super prisons back there in Ontario. And they, one prison has a cook chill operation run by private industry that cooks, that, that produces all the food for all the super prisons. It's like um, TV dinners, you know, like they're frozen and then they're shipped out to all the different prisons and reheated in microwaves and distributed to the, these little, like what I described, the pods, right? But, um, yeah, so, so um, you know, liberal reformers, I think put emphasis on the problem is the prisoners. And I'm not saying that, that it is true. A lot of prisoners do need a better education. Like they most a lot of prisoners, because of their, their background, have not had the opportunity. A lot of prisoners um, have addiction issues, uh, job lack job skills. I'm not saying that should not be addressed. But to think that that is the solution to get rid of crime or get rid of prisons is is is, is an illusion. You know, so um, that leads me to the, the, the last little part here about, so what is the solution? And I would think, I, I, I'd say it's a bit of a paradox because I think the solution being a revolutionary, by political, I would say I am an anarchist revolutionary, um, that the solution is ultimately that we really do have to have a different kind of political economic system. Like, I do think capitalism is unsustainable. It's just illogical. It cannot go on the way it is. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to lecture you about it. But um, So the only way you're going to get rid of prisons is to have a system where there is no, where there is no despair, you know, where there is not a need for, no, who is going to go out and rob a bank? unless you either have a drug problem or you really need money. I mean, just, when you really look logically at crime, well, so the, the percentage of people that would do it for fun are probably the people that are under 18 years old. You know what I mean? And they're out having a whack of a weird, wacky time, right? Like, at a certain point, you're not going to go there and risk your life to do this kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> but the problem with... Uh, obliterating any kind of reform is so much revolutionary activity. If it is not insurrection or in, you know riots or you know large scale militant resistance movements, is is fairly abstract. You know writing and speaking, which is a good thing too. But I would argue that um, you can use so called reform. If, you, if it's based or grounded within a revolutionary perspective and based on revolutionary principles, like OCAP, for example, <laughs> that's, I'm just sort of referring that to you. But um, like any action, if you, if you, like, you could, let's say sabotage, you reuse the word sabotage. Like a lot of people are going to go, okay, that's like anarchist sabotage, right? But let's face it, fascists have used sabotage imperialist armies have used sabotage, so what makes one sabotage different from another? It's obviously the, the, the politics that's embedded in the goals, right? And I think it's true, too, of reform. And I think the best example I can think of, although, I better say this while I can here, the only problem with reforms, with attempts, they're good, I think, perhaps, 
for a short period of time, but capitalism is extremely adept at co-opting even any kind of reform, like I sort of tried to explain here with Grand Valley and Fraser Valley after closing a few for W. Um, um, but in, but it's, like if you look at capitalism as a metaphor, as a form of, okay, cancer, it's a chronic um, fatal disease. And I do think capitalism in history will prove itself to be a chronic fatal disease. Um, but does that mean that you're not going to give the, the person who's dying painkillers or bandages or any kind of palliative care? So even though we know that we live in this society that ha you know has this crop, we, we live within a, uh, an economic system that is has a is, is, it's just inevitably someday going to have a chronic fatal end. Um, I think that we we still have to have compassion, but we can use some of these reforms as a way of educating people, helping people for the moment. And one example would be somebody who's been solitary for two years. Like are you going to go in there and say, hey, too bad, buddy. Um, you know, I'm a revolutionary, I'm not going to waste my time trying to add, get rid of solitary because probably it's going to be co-opted eventually. Like you, you know, you're probably going to try to do something. And I think the best example of a good, of, of how reform can work to a certain, at least for a certain period of time, is the harm reduction um, strategies that have been used by people who've been trying to eradicate drug addiction. Um, you know, abstinence and criminalizing people obviously doesn't work, whereas harm reduction has proven to be very effective. It doesn't necessarily eradicate all drug addiction, but it is a compassionate way of helping people to overcome their addictions. And I think, yeah, solidarity of yeah. too, that brings people together. Yeah. And crime rates have been going down steadily since 1998, or, and before. And yeah, prison populations have been going up. Like, that's a really weird paradox. How do you explain that? And I would suggest that um, that the crime rate has been going down no matter what government's in power. People have done research on this, and okay, they okay, prisoner populations have been going up steadily, and and crime rates have been going down. Like how do you explain that? And in the United States, there's been studies. Again, you've got to Google this because I wasn't going to flail around facts for, for the whole time. Um, despite, like some states have not implemented law, the, the kind of policies that let's say Reagan implemented or, or George Bush. So I would suggest it is harm reduction policies because if you've ever been involved in anything to do with addictions, huge percentages of crimes are related to addictions, whether it's alcoholism or cocaine or whatever. But then now, I think we've come to a point in history, I'm almost finished here. I know you guys are really going so bad. Um, we've come to a point in history where I'm starting to see that harm reductions are still good, but you can really see now that capitalism is recuperating it, adapt, like, you know, co-opting it. Like in Ontario, for example, again, these are statistics I looked at beforehand. In 1996, there was like 3,000 addicts who were using methadone clinics. They started off as these like grassroots needle exchanges, you know, ex-addicts driving around bicycles, you know, delivering uh, clean needles. And then you had radical doctors, you know, opening up these <coughs> methadone clinics and blah, blah, blah. But as time has gone on, like if you're, I, 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 I uh, like I referred to here, I, I had a, a drug problems with all the harm reduction community. Like it's unbelievable. I live in Kingston and there must be like six like there used to be one methadone clinic. Now there's like six of them, and they're all private except for one, the original one. The rest of them are all these private companies that run them. And uh, so there was, what did I say, 3,000 um, addicts were using methadone clinics in 1996. Now there's 55,000 in 2016. You know, so you see that you know the the far big pharmaceutical companies. They, they got a win-win thing going on here all the way around. Like they're selling the opiates, the oxycontins, the Percocets, the Percodon, the, the fentanyl. And then, hey, we're selling the methadone too. And it's like pennies apparently to make it or for the amount that people take. And in Ontario, it's $5 a dose no matter whether you're getting a minuscule amount or a lot. So 
you know, you can't help but sort of go, oh, God, you know. But now, I mean, I still think most people right across the board will still say that methadone and harm reduction policies are great, you know. But they're just going too far. Like, in prison, uh, there's a woman who was in there in 1984, and she's still in there. Once again, there are always indigenous women who have these horrific things going on. And she was put on methadone for a while, and she'd never been out. As a, as a behavioral state, they called it for, be, for stabilizing her behavior. And I think it's because if you don't get your method on, you feel so sick. It's probably very easy to control. I don't know, maybe it does, it does sort of stabilize, maybe, but it's, it's still a false use of, of that kind of drug. So I'm not gonna keep going on and on. It's, all, it's like 22, almost like, you know, I thought maybe people wanted to ask questions or talk about something or, if you want to go home early, I don't care. I got a question. 